And we're back, everybody. And we are here with Mr. Kenny Casanova. Kenny, what's up, my friend? Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, we, uh, we have been dying to talk to you. Um, I mean, you've done so much in wrestling that we don't know where to start. So if someone were to come up to you and say, Kenny, what do you do in wrestling? Where would you start? It's tough. I'm all over the place, but I guess usually I would say something like I was, a, I, I would compare myself to like a Jimmy Hart or a Captain Lou Albano or something like that, because that role isn't even really all that there. It's starting to come back a little bit, but you know, Vince doesn't like that. So, uh, you know, I explain what it is and then I try to tell them some of the names that, you know, I can kind of ride the coattails off of a little bit. And people you know, well, so, <laughs> let, let's, let's talk about some of the names and then I want to jump right into that. Cause that was one of the questions I was going to ask you. So let's talk about some of the guys that you've co-authored with you've uh been manager for you've worked with let's let's go through the quick list for everybody sure okay so uh big names that maybe i've worked with managing uh let's see uh i played kimchi for kamala a little bit and that was my first book uh that kind of worked pretty seamlessly because i knew him so you know it was a pretty easy fit there uh managed king kong bundy uh, Nikolai Volkov, a lot of the real old school 80s guys that a lot of people grew up with. Um, as far as books are concerned, uh, I did Kamala's, Brutus Beefcakes, uh, The Ref, Danny Davis, Sabu, uh, Big Van Vader, Tito Santana, uh, currently working with um, uh, uh, The Good Brothers. And I haven't said this anywhere yet, but I'm doing one with ODB because Mick Foley asked me to do hers. He begged me to do it. So I'm doing hers at the same time as I'm doing the Good Brothers now. Oh, well, as Steph's ears perked up, because she's <laughs> a big Good Brothers fan. All right. All right. Yeah, I'm a <laughs> talk and shop Patreon. <laughs> do all the boozing with the boys every other week with those those fools. That's great. So that's got to be an adventure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how do you, that. how do you, okay, so did you like, how do you keep those guys on track? It's well, you know, actually, I've only been interviewing Luke so far. It's that new. We only have about 10 pages written or so. And uh, to see them on talk and shop, you know, on YouTube or, you know, listen to the uh, the podcast. Um, it, that's not who I have on the horn with me that he you wouldn't believe it or not. He does the character so well that when you actually talk to him and he sends me samples of his writings, I'm like, it doesn't even seem like the same person. It's almost like they rang a bell and he turned into something else, you know? So that was a Festus joke, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Steph, would you have guessed that, that, that Luke's really not what he seems to be on camera? No, I definitely know. Cause I mean, we do the boozing with the boys and everyone gets drunk and it's a blast, but <laughs> There's a small group of us at this point. There's like maybe 20, 25 of us that do these and it's become like a family. And we actually have really great conversations with Gallows, um, Chad and, and Rocky. So it's, it's really cool. So we do get to see that side of him at times too. So uh, with other people that I've done books for, say like Big Van Vader, he was uh, a four-year process. Like he took a long time and, um, you know, getting... So there would be weeks where I wouldn't even talk to him. It would just be tough to connect with him for, uh, for Luke though. I mean, it's like he first, after the first uh, discussion we had, he started, he sent me probably like 50 pictures and uh, he, um, he hooked me up with Colt Cabana so I could get a, a, a transcript of an old interview there. And he's really proactive more so than I've seen with any of them. Like I have uh, just incredible's book coming out probably in a month or two, it's ready. And we want to do a little polish up right to the end. And we're having a little time, a difficult time, like connecting um, just with their schedules and stuff. But Luke goes out of his way to make sure that like um, he's right there. So he uh, he's, he's good. He knows his stuff. <laughs> that, it's shocking with all that they have going on. Cause I feel like the second they left WWE, he just dove into business oh, yeah. on yeah. all fronts between the beer, the yeah. whiskey, all his promotion that he has. I'm surprised that he's on top oh, of it that much. Running. So it is tough. It is tough to meet up with him, but he's making time for me. Whereas some That's guys, great. you know, they don't want to talk wrestling on their time off. And I totally get that, you know, um, because the guy like him, he's, he gets off the airplane, he goes and tapes, and then he goes off to do the same thing the next day again. And it's another two or three day process, you know, because he's doing, is he doing impact and he's doing AEW appearances. So he's all mm -hmm. over the place. Let's talk about, I mean, you broke into the business at a time when kayfabe was huge and, you know, 
there was the inner circle of wrestling and then no one on the outer outside circle really knew what was going on. And now we're in a, in a climate where like, once they get off taping, they're in a, like uh, a Patreon or a zoom where they're drinking with like 20 fans. Right. So how's that different from where you came in to now? Like, you know, that that's, that's, those are two completely different worlds. Yeah, it was tough. I mean, I started 90 tail end, 92, 93, mm-hmm. you know, and um, that was pre attitude era. You know, uh, and I think Attitude Era, they went for more realism when they saw the success of NWO um, and they tried, you know, big at the time was, uh, you know, MTV's real world and documentary, uh, that kind of stuff was going on. So um, Eric Bischoff kind of put the NWO out there to make people think that that was, you know, something that could really happen, Um, you know, and I think just more and more snowball, let's let's. uh, you know, what's the word, um, uh, suspend disbelief, but maybe there is some realism still there. They had to kind of do that because they were kind of letting the cat out of the bag everywhere. And, um, but now, I mean, it's out. So everybody kind of gets it now. I'm still a little bit old school. Like if I were to go do a wrestling show or appearance or something like that, and I see a move that that it looks to me like both guys are kind of cooperating to make it happen. Um, like the Canadian destroyer or something like that, you know, some little things like that bother me still, you know, and that's the old school guy in me, but I totally get it. And if you were to ask me what I watch, I mean, mostly I never miss AEW and I kind of almost totally during COVID stopped watching WWE at all. Like I just said, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> Sounds just like us. And if you noticed Chris during you talking about that, yeah. if you notice his face, his favorite thing is people waiting around for things to happen. Oh yeah. I mean, is it the catch? <laughs> The, the yes. cash spot. Oh my god! Yes, yes. <laughs> like Kenny, I complain about it every week. It's like it's so everybody. Wrong. Let's all huddle together, even though we're fighting each other. Let's all stand there and put our hands out because this yeah. guy's coming. Yeah. Like if I'm wrestling this guy, I'm gonna be like, screw you. I'm not putting my hands out. I'm not yeah. catching you. I they want should you to have just down. outlaw that spot. That spot at this time. I mean, <laughs> the only way that that could ever work is if like somebody's walking by. And then they turn around and then get hit. So they're not facing him. Then maybe you can kind of believe it. But otherwise, it usually looks like a bowling ball with like 12 guys, get, you know, getting <laughs> taking the taking the bump. It's ridiculous. And then they all go down. So The, the other one that bothers me, too, is the um, the move that what you're doing, the, the, the possibilities of moves and the strikes you can make aren't as good as the one you end up making. So, like, if you're going right at a guy and you can clothesline him. That would be the best move. But the guys that like turn around and use their back and like, or just like oh, yeah, come yeah. backwards or like, right. it's like, that's not even close. Like if you're to strike a guy and knock him down, you're literally giving up like, like, like Darby does one for, he did one from the top rope last night where I was like, that takes more or that other one that drives me nuts too. The, the setting up on the rope, they set the guy up in the top rope and the guy just sits there while the other guy's climbing up and waiting. It's like, what, yeah. uh, what are you no, doing? No, you're not going to you sit there punch him or you do something to try to get him off right yeah and it's <laughs> like you. come on guys you know that you got to know that doesn't look good all right and there's a couple guys i think that get it and know not to do some of that stuff but uh yeah. the majority of them have been trained by a weak trainer's trainer of a trainer and now they're kind of losing some of that realism aspect and now it's all newer school guys that didn't grow up with pretending to even think that maybe we should make it look real. They just think it's a stage thing. And man, when I started out um, and it wasn't, I mean, you know, there's people far um, in the sport longer than me um, that are still kicking around and way more accomplished than me. I, um, I learned with a handful of guys out of kind of Southwestern New York. Uh, Tom Brandy was one of them, a guy named King Kalua who trained him and also Steve Carino, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and Al Carino is retired. So, I mean, we're kind of making me, you know, I'm dating myself. <laughs> um, uh, a guy named TC Reynolds, a guy named Preston Seal, uh, Bam Bam Bigelow was around a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, Jimmy Superfly Snooka um, was on a ton of shows with me. Um, uh, the Ma- Metal Maniac was a guy that used to drive around. Guys like this, some old school um, indie guys and some names that um, were somewhat established. Um, they would always run the same spot. And I remember seeing this over and over and over again, but it was sort of real. It was back in 93, 94. And I was saying this to Luke uh, Gallows the other day, and I wanted to see what you guys think about this, but there used to be a brass knuckles spot 
and uh, or a foreign object or like you they would hide something they'd hit it and then they hide it from the ref and george anvil steel used to kind of hold his hand in the back with this thing and keep the ref just conveniently out of the loop so he couldn't see it um if we were today to do something like that and bring back like the old school foreign object which when you hit someone that would really do some damage or something like that, it would be believable. It would be like brand new again Mm -hmm. because nobody's doing that type of stuff. So I think it'd be cool for one guy just to take that old school gimmick. There's all kinds of spots. I don't know if you remember, like they would get the, get the, the uh, brass knuckles, hit a guy, they put it under their arm, pin the guy, and then the ref would hold up their arm and then it would fall and they'd look down and then reverse the decision. Like there were a ton of different Memphis cool spots. And one guy Mm -hmm. could like, go and watch all the tapes and do that again. So if anyone's listening, I challenge people to do, to take that on again and be the brass, brass knuckle guy or whatever yeah. <laughs> or foreign objects back. I mean, they don't even check the boots or the tights anymore. None of that. Cause nobody cheats now. And uh, right. I think if you were a cheater, the few guys that do kind of do a good job with really trying to get that villain um, role going, you know, again, um, uh, and why am I thinking of the wrong three letters? MJF. That is not <laughs> correct. No, you're right. That is, that yeah. is it. Okay, wait. Yeah. That's right. He, I mean, he. That's what I'm talking about. He he has no problem keeping in kayfabe and being heel and, and trying to play the villain. But there's a lot of guys that want to sell merch and they don't want to do that. So, therefore, we don't have the villain that wants to cheat anymore. We have the villain that wants to out wrestle people, which is not really the right formula. <laughs> so, but here's what I love about MJF. Not only does he stay in character the entire time, think about whenever down the line when he does make that face turn, think about how huge that's going to be. If he ever does, I I think he probably will at some point. Like, I think he's going to suffer from the same fate that like a Ric Flair would. Eventually he's going to be around for so long that people are going to love him just because he's been around for so long. But like when he turns because he's been a jerk for so long, like it's going to be huge, a huge moment. So I think he does it right. But I, one thing I want to get back to that you, that you brought up about the like, the holding the brass knucks and the, and the ref. Uh, so my kids watch and they're 11 and eight. All right. And they were watching me w- with me one night and we were watching WWE and I don't even remember what the match was, but like five minutes into it, my son turns around, he goes, what's the point of the referee? They really don't do anything. <laughs> That's true. Right. <laughs> and it's so much different because if you watch the old school matches, like 60s, 70s and eighties, like the ref was, he was the authority, like breaking up, you know, breaking up things in the corner and making sure now it's just like the ref is there to maybe count three doesn't even get it right. Half the time. It's just like, what's the point of the ref anymore? Yeah. I mean, I guess it would be funny to have a ref get a guy up against the ropes and count one, two, three, four, five, and then end the match and people would go, what the hell is that? (laughs) I don't think it's been done since, you know, uh, you know, 20 years or more, more than 20, probably 30 years ago. Yes. I I don't even know if Steph knows this Steph. Did you know in the old, well, they brought it over to WCW, but in the old NWA, if you threw your opponent over the top rope, it was an automatic disqualification. Oh, no. Match yeah. would end. No, yeah. no idea. <laughs> yep. What? No. Yep. Yeah. That was yeah. one of the rules. Couldn't throw the guy over the mat. Couldn't, couldn't throw the guy over the ropes. Yeah. Think no. about what, think about the, what that would do now for matches. If you couldn't throw a guy over the ropes. Yeah. How many, <laughs> how many spots that takes out? Did like, they do no, no jumping off the top rope for a while too. WCW. I'm pretty yeah, sure they did. <laughs> I think that was when, I think that was when Bill Watts came back. Right. Right. And like, cause he was big into like the ground game kind of like, and yep. he didn't want any top. And it's funny that you bring that up because that actually, uh, and it wasn't mentioned in the Pillman documentaries. Did you watch Dark Side of the ring? I do watch it. I, I haven't seen the Pillman one. Yet. The Pillman one is great, but they, they brought up how he was kind of like held back because him and Austin, they uh, they headlined that clash of the champions with Flair against Flair and Arn Anderson. And it didn't do well oh, okay. in the ratings. And that like ruined his push. But around that same time was when Bill Watts eliminated the off the top rope. And when right. you take off the top rope away from flying Brian Pillman, what else can he do? What else is there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So right. some rule changes I'm into, some of them are just plain dumb, like would never... I would never understand, but so let's get back to the, um, to the book writing and stuff. Let's actually talk about how did you get into wrestling? Uh, okay. So I was running a comic book store while I was going to college to get my teaching degree. And uh, a guy came through there and was talking about how he was going to go to a wrestling school. We eventually hired this guy. And then he said, Hey, do you want to come with me? And I went with him. And uh, I took all the same lessons he did, but I said I wanted to be a manager. 
because they weren't going to charge me. So I was like, well, that's cool. I can get in there. And so I was kind of writing some things, promos and filming and doing little behind the scenes stuff. And I also learned how to wrestle at the same time. And uh, they let me kind of help sell shows and some different things. And I didn't really have to pay to get in. I kind of earned my way in, but not trying to be a guy that was going to wrestle really. But then they, they just threw me into everything. And I started doing manager spots and all kinds of stuff, ring announcing and things. So I kind of learned like, you know, stuff behind the scenes a lot and uh, traveled with that guy, traveled with a bunch of other people and um, just kind of took off from there. And I, I started doing a lot of uh, shows with like, I would manage three or four guys in the show. I'd run in the back, put on a different costume, come back out, you know, and lots of appearances. So I got to work with a lot of people. So it was pretty cool. cool. Now, what did you enjoy more doing the managing or wrestling? Probably the managing. I wasn't great at wrestling. I mean, I could do it, but I, I knew that I wasn't you know, it wasn't my area of expertise. So uh, the managing was fun because I got to do a lot of personality and uh, um, I really learned, you know, it's important not to steal heat. There's a lot of managers today who will jump up on the apron when they're not supposed to and turn around and do stuff to the audience and, you know, and, and the guys are working their ass off in the ring and stuff. So um, the old school way was, you know, always to, to um, pick your spots and know when to do stuff. Um, and I think I did it pretty well. So I started getting a lot of work in different places and they started putting me with the main event guys. And a lot of times the neat part about that back then is, is if you had a guy like, um, say, uh, Sid was on the show or King Kong Bundy or somebody, uh, Iron Mike Sharp did some shows with me and stuff like that. Um, some of these guys were done with WWF at the time. Uh, so when they came to do these independent shows, they didn't want to bump real heavy. They were kind of older in the twilight of their career. So that's why they would want a, a decent manager to come help them. So I could come in, maybe take a bump, or I could do some stuff to make the match more entertaining. Um, you know, and they were smart like that to, to want to use that. And um, I started to get requested by different guys. And in fact, Kamala started requesting me to play kimchi. And I got a costume all together and did some uh, in upstate New York and over in Jersey um, in the Northeast uh, for Kamala. Um, so then when years later, when he lost his legs, um, I had my teaching degree by then I called him up. I said, Hey man, why don't we put a book out and uh, you can keep all the money for it and we'll see, you, you know, we'll do a Kickstarter and see what we can do for you. And he said, can that sounds like a good idea, but <laughs> what I'm going to, I don't know. Have you heard Kamala's real voice before? Uh, I said, sort of, yes. that sort of I, yeah, we <laughs> yes. watched, I watched the, the YouTube videos of the trip okay. the tributes and the, the ride. Good. All right. Cause otherwise I might, I would, I think that probably sounded ridiculous. But <laughs> no, no, it was I, I got perfect. It. <laughs> He's like, but I'm going to need you to, to call uh, somebody that I trust to talk to uh, and, and kind of run it by and make sure everything's good. If you don't mind. And I said, sure, sure. So, I call up Coco Beware. <laughs> He's like, Kenny, I want you to do a good job for Kamala. Just like his grandmother could, or his grandfather, because uh, he wants people to help him and do a good job for him. <laughs> and he does the whole gimmick. And I'm like, oh, geez. All right. So um, he just didn't want him to get screwed because the guy got screwed a lot, you know. So I said, I'm going to give it all to him. You'll see. So uh, we did a good job. It went on um, uh, Steve Austin's podcast, Piper's podcast at the time. And uh, we made something like 60 grand for him. So uh, the book did super well. And after that, you know, when there's money kicking around, the other guys hear about it and they want me to do their book. And that, then that spun, you know, off into a different area. So mm -hmm. how hard is it when you're, when you're talking to guys like that, but maybe the newer guys are probably a little bit easier, but the, the older guys, how hard is it to kind of like, not just keep them on track, but kind of it's tough that can be tough right <laughs> but not just that but like keep keep them from stopping the bullshit like keep, get, like stop the gimmick like let's really talk to the guy behind the kamala character right. you know what i mean like how hard was that part because some guys were just always in gimmick right right well so most of them would not really hit me with the gimmick but if you want to talk with uh the no bullshit idea um sometimes a guy would say i don't want to talk about this and then I'd have to have an intelligent conversation with them to say, if you leave it out, you may lose sales because someone will say in the comments on the book, the reviews, they're going to say, uh, Ken Batera, you don't want to talk about the McDonald's incident or um, Brutus, they accuse you of uh, cocaine or anthrax or something to this degree. If you don't tell this story in your book, um, you know, different things like that. So 
uh, once you have the conversation with them, um, I think I was pretty good at convincing them. We'll put it in there, but we, you know, we'll we'll put it in there, telling your side of the story, how you want to tell it, you know, and uh, it'll be there forever. And uh, hopefully, the book will, um, you know, go down to future generations, and they'll look at stuff like this because the book is forever; it'll last forever. When we put the the Vader bo- uh, Vader time book out. Uh, he passed away just before the book came out, like just, just before. And he was very concerned with wanting to be in the hall of fame. That was like a big deal for him. Didn't happen, but I said to him, the book's going to be your hall of fame. We're going to put it out there and it'll be there forever, you know, but we got to touch upon all the different little things that happened. And he was super good about making that happen. How long does the process start? You said uh, Vader took two years, but like, what's the typical length of time? Usually I, I need a good year. You know, and I, I have taken a year to write two books at the same time, but they both took a year by the time they were finished to come out. So I was writing, uh, uh, well, Sabu's and Vader's were both completed within a year's time, but uh, Vader's interview process took three years before that year. So technically it took four years. Uh, we had a draft at a two year point. He had been, Vader had been diagnosed with two years to live. He had like a um, uh, congenitive heart failure, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. And then he said, you know, we got to go back. I don't really want to shit on every guy is bad because if (laughs) I die and I hadn't made peace with these guys, words that live on are screw Ric Flair for this or whoever they're mad at, you know? So, um, we decided to fine tooth comb the whole thing and clean up a couple little sections where he felt like he had slighted some people. I like there was a flip-flop incident with Paul Orndorff you might have, you might have read about, you know, so he wanted to go back and kind of clean that up a little bit, you know, and make sure, you know, so it, it lasted another two years, you know, so that, that book took four years to come out. And uh, when he finally passed, uh, we added a, a, an epilogue from his son, who was an NXT wrestler. Uh, I don't know if you know him, Jesse White, uh, mm-hmm. but he wrestled a little bit for NXT uh, and um, very moving, um, piece at the end on uh, you know his father's life talking about all of the health concerns and everything that just kind of like you know compiled up in the end so it is it's a little tough a little sad at the end you know um but uh we're both happy how it came out with and i think he would be too so now as you're going through interviews with these wrestlers uh was there one in particular that had better recall than the others or did you have to like kind of work stories out of people so as far as the process is concerned, what I do a lot is I'll uh, I'll go to online and I'll get shoot interviews and I listen to all the shoot interviews because I figure why ask the wrestler the same questions they've already answered a million times. Um, and then I'll ask them questions that nobody's asked before. For instance, I got ODB on the horn yesterday or two days ago, and I'm asking her, what breakfast cereal did you like? Uh, Stephanie, what breakfast cereal, by the way, did you like when you were growing up? I was a Frosted Flakes girl. See, so has anyone asked you that before? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> we right? actually had a serial conversation oh, previously yeah, right. on the podcast, but no, not directly. But you it was only because like, we were what? talking about Scorpio Sky not eating cereal before. <laughs> so maybe if I ask you what cartoons did you watch growing up on Saturday morning or if that? Yeah, it was Doug, but no one's asked me that. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, and then being able to get that kind of stuff together, you know, um, really fills the book out. So sometimes they're good at that. Like you said, did somebody have a, um, a better memory? ODB is sharp. Like she seems to know her stuff really well. Um, say that you interviewed like Brutus Beefcake or like someone that really sticks out. And I didn't do his book, but Hacksaw Jim Duggan. If you have seen a Hacksaw Jim Duggan interview, he hits you with the same stories over and over and over and over again. So um, it's almost like I think they don't have uh, a whole lot of other stuff to fall onto because after 40 years, if you've told 20 or 30 really good stories and polished them, those are the go-tos that you would want to go to. I can think of some other people that do that too, where um, you ask them, tell me about uh, this guy. Tell me about John Cena. And they'll go, John Cena was like one of the greatest wrestlers in the world. And, you know, he wrestled the rock. Let me tell you a rock story. Mm-hmm. So if you, if you think about what I just did, they're very good at transitioning from whatever you just asked over to the other story that they've told a million times. So um, sometimes a good way around that is to interview other wrestlers about stories about them and then retelling that story to the wrestler 
and then seeing what they remember, they remember about it and then putting it into their voice as a ghostwriter. Mm -hmm. So um, let me think of an example of something I did with that. I mean, sometimes you look at some of my books, I have a lot of like guest passages where they'll just go ahead. Like um, Rob Van Dam wrote a guest passage in Sabu's book, which would make sense, you know, Mm -hmm. but maybe there's a story in Sabu's book that actually Rob Van Dam told me, then I told Sabu and Sabu added to it. And then I put it in the book. So that's kind of how I do it. So uh, it's weird. (laughs) No, we just had a similar situation uh, with Nikita Koloff. He was on, gosh, like a month ago. And it was the, um, the Crockett clothesline moment that he had just talked about on Conrad and Tony's podcast and hadn't heard him say that they had kind of heat backstage. Nikita was like, what? I don't know about this. So in a similar situation, kind of got the other side of that story that's been told a thousand times. Right, right. And that really fills out the story though, to get it from a couple of guys like that. So if Mm -hmm. I've got a a neat story that was really building up, I would ask a couple of different guys and see what I can get out of the deal. And then sometimes it might turn a three page story or a three paragraph story into 10, 20 pages of real interesting stuff. So Mm -hmm. That technique seems to work. We uh, we had Sean Oliver on a couple uh, months ago, and he told us that a lot of times what he would have to do, especially for the shoot interviews, was like these guys aren't going to remember every single thing. Yeah. So if you say to them, the garden in 84, when you wrestled, you know, Hogan, they'll be like, OK, but you'd be like, and then you ended it with this and then this happened and there was this many people here. And this was the if the more facts you give them, the more they're like, oh, right, right. I remember what you're talking about. So he's like, you lead the horse to water, like just just bring me to that point where you want me to talk about. Right. And then I'll eventually get to it with as many facts as you give me. See, that works when you're doing like a two hour shooting interview and you're interviewing the guy and then you're going to put a cap to that. And you really like do your research and get your um your ducks in line for the questions you're going to ask and figure out how to lead the questions like that. But sometimes what will happen is while I'm interviewing them, they'll say some pearl of wisdom I didn't hear anywhere, you Mm -hmm. know, and then I'll have to either work up some of those questions for the next interview with them or take that. And when they say, I don't know anything else about that. I just remember this, you know, I just remember Andre the giant um, in a, in a hotel in Japan, uh, shitting on a sofa on a sofa and all of the Japanese guys put on hazmat suits to go clean it. So then I would go, well, wow, well, let me go ask somebody else about that. <laughs> like, I need more information on yeah, that. Yeah, you know, more than one sentence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then I'll ask a few other guys and then I find out where that hotel was or I might find out uh, what color the hazmat suits were mm-hmm. or what color the shit was on the couch, <laughs> you know, or whatever. So well, did you ever work with someone where like you, you had a personal relationship with them outside of interviewing. And when you sat down to talk about the book, they were very like same five answers they've been giving over the years. But then when you were just talking on a personal level, they would share things and be way more like, not just eloquent, but like a a deeper dive into what they were about. And and you would say to them, like, why can't you say this when we're interviewing? Like, why are you saying it now? Yeah, you know, all of them, I got a little bit of that where um, I think they fall into that pattern story of the, the, the same 20 stories that they like to tell, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I, I can't fault them and I'm not critiquing them on this because my mind works the same way. I mean, if, uh, if you were to ask me what um, Disney character I would be, I'd probably be, you know, the fish on Nemo that forgets everything, mm-hmm. Dory. I'm probably a little bit of that because after a while, I just, you know, forget. So when you ask any of these guys, you know, where, like you said, where were you, uh, who you're wrestling 1984 at Madison Square Garden, <laughs> they don't remember any of that. You know, they just remember there was an instance where this happened and this, you know, was the outcome. So um, uh, I'll have like all of a sudden after you put a book out and then, Maybe Brutus is like, oh, uh, he puts on social media, check out this picture uh, I found in the attic or whatever. It wouldn't have been great for the book and you didn't think he had any picture like that when we were putting <laughs> the book together, you know what I mean? So um, a lot of it's just stumbling on stuff to uh, after the fact and just kind of, you know, kicking yourself, I think, a little bit that you didn't ask the right question maybe or something sometimes, but. Right. Was there ever a moment when you're going through these interviews that you're like, this isn't going to work as a book? Like this, this isn't it. I didn't think Vader's book was going to come out. I mean, as you know, a lot of people say he's stubborn to work with. He he would go dark for six months at a time. And I'd be like this. I would 
have nightmares about. I've got half the book done. I don't know if it'll ever get finished. Um, you know, and I'll text him frantically, Hey, are, what's going on? Are we going to ever finish this? And he would call me up and say, listen, brother, when I go dark, don't worry about it. I just might go dark for eight months. You might not hear from you. It doesn't mean I'm not doing the book. And then he wouldn't talk to me for eight months. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, is this everything going to finish, you know? So, uh, um, but yeah, the, he was tough. Um, I just, about a year ago, I started working with uh, Sid and I saw some similarities to that. And I was like, oh, geez, this one might be tough to write. I was going to do Sid's book. Uh, but then he had a fallen out with um, beforehand with another writer. And that guy put the book out without permission of Sid's, what they had worked on. And then they had to have a court order, shut it down. And then that guy warned that if anybody worked with Sid, he was going to sue them if they used the same type of stories. And I'm like, okay, I'm out. <laughs> You're so like, yeah, I, I no part yeah, of that. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't want to get sued. So I was, I yeah. Don't know. No soft, no softball stories are worth that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, uh, but yes, if you do that, Sid did no show a couple of uh, interviews with me. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> yeah, it was softball season. Uh, but but what, what, I, what I find fascinating about the whole Vader thing, look, I mean, we've all been there when we kind of like wanted to disappear. But the guy worked in a profession where you had to show up night in and night out. Right. So how do you check that box you can show up and do your job but then you have to do this other thing and you just don't talk to the guy for eight months yeah maybe i maybe i sort of answered that before though i think when they have time off some right. of them don't value that time off as you know maybe upping their stakes or um uh, creating more merchandise or what have you you know outside of the ring the appearance money type of thing they would prefer to act normal and, and watch TV, watch, you know, watch football, maybe spend time with family. And so I get it. So, you know, sometimes if I'll shoot just incredible a message, Hey, we're going to do an interview. Um, you want to do it at two 30. He's like, yeah, let's do it. And then I can't find him at two 30. I know he's got a kid. I know he's got a wife. I know they've had some health issues. Um, so I don't nag him. I'll just hit him up the next day and see what we can do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it usually works out. So. Uh, any of the guys, that you wrote uh, books about, did any of them share a story when you were just like, we, we can't print that. We can't put that. A couple. So what I do is I print it, but I take the name out. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let me think of one. Uh, here's one in Justin Incredibles book. Um, let's see. He had some demons. I mean, this guy was known for some, you know, drug issues and he'll tell you that he went through um, a detox program with WWE wellness and the whole deal. Um, he told a story where one of the big names on WWE roster, so a former heavyweight champion, so a big name, uh, would ask him for drugs. And what they did was they took a Sega Genesis game and they opened it up, the screws, mm -hmm. and they took the, the, the card out, the, the microchip, and they would put eight balls of Coke in there and mail it back and forth to each other because they were on different rosters and wouldn't see each other. And that's how they would send uh, you know illegal substances through the mail because you would it would compress the uh, cartridge down airtight so that a drug sniffing dog and no red flags or anything would go off and they could just put that in the bubble wrap wrap it up and mail it out and it would just look like a sake of genesis game if anyone were to x-ray or look at that so he he told me the name but i'm not going to tell you uh, i was, was. going to say so he told you the name and you were like yeah. mm, let's not do that yeah because uh the idea was some of these guys that have uh, you know, big wow. names now today, you know, uh, and they are um, well off. Those are the ones that tend to actually have lawyers and could sue you for defamation and really come after you because you couldn't really prove that it happened. And, uh, um, you know, and, and it was, definitely was not Hulk Hogan. This is not like a thing, but Hulk Hogan has been known him and Bischoff have been known to do like lawyer and lawsuits and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing wow. Bruce Brutus Beefcake's book, him and Hogan were kind of on the outs. So there was a Twitter war for a time where Beefcake was sending um, Hogan uh, tweets, tagging him to it, uh, saying like, uh, hold on to your um, bandana, brother. I'm telling a tell all book and I'm going to, I'm going to roast you. And Hogan's like, well, you better hold on. Um, to your uh, bandana because I'm going to lawyer up. So then I was like, oh, geez. <laughs> and like, believe it or not, 
Yeah, just before that book came out, I got a call from a guy named David Houston, and it was Hulk Hogan's lawyer. And I had to actually read some passages to him. Uh, and it was just before it went, it actually went to the printers and was already to go and print. And um, fortunately, I had taken the high road. If I had listened to a couple of the ways that they were joking and him and his wife uh, use these words or whatever, we probably would have got sued. But because I protected him, we didn't get sued. In fact, soon after that, uh, Hogan's lawyer must have put me over for the way that we handled it. And then Hogan made good with Vince and then told Vince, brother, Beefcake's being cool again. You should give him Hall of Fame. So because we took the good route, in the book and took the high road they brought him back in gave him merchandise deal action figures came out and they inducted him in the hall of fame so wow so there congratulations is <laughs> throw There's that on your resume to doing that there definitely is and if you go to youtube you can see the little rib i took that the uh, hall of fame uh speech and i isolated him saying and i want to thank kenny casanova for helping me get my book out there and i isolated that and looped it for 10 hours and I put it on <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious um was that around the time that Beefcake was showing up to signings with the fake Hulk Hogan pictures, like signed by Hulk? I remember um, that was one of the things that might have caused heat. Mm-hmm. But then I heard other things like uh, something about a uh, missing necklace. Um, I heard totally something else I can't get into, which was what the lawyer was uh, concerned with. And if that was in the book, then there would have been a lawsuit. Um, you know, Hogan at the time was trying to repair his name because of the whole bubble of the love sponge thing mm. and uh, the sex tape, uh, not necessarily. Um, and I'm not even sure if this was out the the dropping of the racial slur in the in the sex tape. I think it might have been out, but this the sex tape itself was something that very concerned them. And they didn't want, uh, you know, Hulk Hogan uh doing the dirty in the book somewhere, <laughs> you know, with somebody. Mm. So um, we left that out. You know, and it was good that we did. <laughs> was there anybody in the books when like somebody was adamant about a story that you were like, this shouldn't be in there? And they were like, no, brother, it's got to go in. Uh, let me think a second. Uh, well, there was a there was a story with Vader that he really wanted to put in. And we we kind of really cleaned it up second time around and protected names. So at one point he talks about how um who should i say it is then did i say it in the book no okay so he's in a hotel somewhere one night he comes in really late and he sees somebody walk by him who is a wwe official who should not have been in where he was come out of somebody's hotel room he looked in the hotel room and saw a um uh, a super superstar uh who was passed out and looked like just been taken advantage of a, a male not a female a male <laughs> so he he wanted to put in a little bit more than that and that's all i put in i said if we get to either way we don't want vince's lawyers after us and we don't want the other guy being embarrassed about this so it just says that there was something weird that happened at one time that's about it. it's very evasive <laughs> and um, we don't want somebody suing you know vader or me for writing it so that's how you have to kind of clean some things up sometimes i've only i had to do that a couple times in my books otherwise i won't even put the story in because i don't want to tease something and just like you know piss off a reader because then they're gonna want more and they're not getting any more <laughs> mm-hmm. so. most yeah. of my books are 40 pages too so like uh you know they're looking for that stuff so i'll go in another angle and give it to them somewhere else <laughs> <laughs> You're like, you'll forget about this, but <laughs> <laughs> now who is the ultimate book for you? Like who's, would you just love to write? I think a Hogan book would be cool. Like now after the scandals and everything, like, you know, him trying to repair his stuff, that would be pretty cool. I don't know if he'll ever do it. Um, and that probably would propel me to some kind of bestseller right now. I mean, when I put books out, I sell thousands of copies and I do really good. Well, you know, worldwide, but I'm not a New York seller, you know, bestseller. I haven't, I haven't hit one of those where millions of copies are sold. I think something like that probably would. Um, I do also kind of want to do a rock star book. I'd like to jump out of wrestling and do something else. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, just before the Screech died, 
What's that? I said your DJ side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm also a wedding DJ. So uh, doing something with music, I'd like to do. And yeah. I, the closest I came was the Indian from the village people. So I still haven't really done one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Instead, you just play YMCA at weddings. <laughs> <laughs> that too, yeah. Oh, you were going to say something about Screech. Yeah. Almost did his and he passed. So oh, he was man. a big wrestling fan. Yeah, he was a he was oh, a big yeah. wrestling fan. Uh the funny thing, if you want to talk saved by a bell f- for a second, um Luke Gallows, uh our friend Luke Gallows just told me that Mr. Belding is on the do not admit as a guest list for WWE because he showed up so many times backstage and just kind of what would mark the hell out that they don't even let him in the locker room. Anymore. Oh my goodness. No, I do. I do remember Mr. Belding being at a lot of WWE events, but I didn't know that he was like persona non grata. Ah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That, that he was just, uh, he's just so uh, such a hanger on. That's an amazing story. That's an amazing story. They won't let him in. Uh, oh, that's great. He does appearances with my friend's uh, cover band. Oh yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Nice. Um, has anyone ever approached you to do, I'm going to screw this word up. So Steph, help me out here. Okay. Posthumously. Uh, Has anyone approached you to do a book like that? A a few. (laughs) So uh, sensational Sherry's son, Mm -hmm. I think uh, Captain Lou Albano's daughter's friend. And that wasn't enough for me. The daughter, I probably would do it. Actually, Mm -hmm. I'm a pretty big Captain Lou Albano mark, but the, daughter's friend i didn't think was even official enough um and then there's a lot of people from time to time that hey, it'd be cool if you did this but you know um thus far no i haven't really delved into the dead <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think that'd be an interesting thing because like there's a, there's a couple out there like one guy that fascinates me a lot um buddy landell mm. For some yeah, reason, yeah. like, I mean, the guy it's, it's, it's Joe, it's so amazing. So I, I forget which book I was reading. I, I watch a lot of old, like NWA stuff and the, the guy's walking around as the nature boy. So he's the nature boy, buddy Landell. Imagine like right now, if there was like another stone cold, like that just, it, it happened yeah. in the territory days. It would never happen now. Yeah. But, like he was supposed to be this like big thing and feud with flair. And then like, just, so many times just like, just didn't give a crap. Like yeah. from the stories that I've heard, the shoot interviews, like he had the opportunity and whenever opportunity came, you just like, nah, and just yeah. didn't. So that that's like one of the, one of the books that I would be interested. But then when you get so far away from these guys, like passing away and the people that knew them, like it's gotta be much harder yeah. to gather all the information. Yeah. I, I heard a, a buddy Landell story. That's kind of funny. Um, and I'll tell it since you brought it up. I, I don't know if I'll ever tell it again. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, the Yakuza in, in Japan is like the Japanese mafia. They've got yeah. their hand in like all of the wrestling shows, at least back in the day they did. And they would kind of run the whole deal and they would scare people into uh, buying tickets and selling tickets for them. And uh, if nobody showed up, that was fine because that was sort of their way of being like the mafia and offering protection. Um, you know, come to my wrestling show and, you'll be fine. You know, that mm-hmm. kind of deal. Um, these guys had like, uh, you know, big sleeves of tattoos before that was really a thing. They were very identifiable for their tattoos. And one of the things that they were known for was that if they pissed off one of their, their bosses, one of their mafia Lord bosses, um, they would lose a finger. They would cut a finger off on the guy. So uh, basically if you saw a guy with a couple of fingers missing, you would know not only is he a Yakuza member, but he is someone within that group that has pissed off people and maybe a tough guy, you know, kind of an asshole. (laughs) So um, one time Buddy Landell got out of uh, his limo and he's getting ready to go to uh, a show for Antonio Inoki. And one of the Yakuza guys uh, scooped him up and said, Hey, you want to go out and let's get something to eat. And a lot of times those guys would kind of mark out, bring him to a, uh, restaurant spent big bucks on them, hundreds of dollars on these. Um, is that expensive uh, steak? What is that called out there? Kobe beef, right? Kobe. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he's like, yeah, I'd love to do it. And that's a big thing out there because quite often um, a lot of the guys didn't know really where to go to get um, good food for cheap. That you know, and, and protein based because a lot of it was very carby based. You know, mm. um, so he goes and shakes the guy's hand, and when he shakes it, he feels that there's really only like two fingers in his hand. So he looks down at his hand, looks up at the guy and he goes, geez, who the hell did you piss off? Because he, <laughs> he knew, he knew, you know, so. Wow. 
Yeah, that's, I that's funny. Tough. I, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing the guy laughed about that. <laughs> yeah, I would hope because <laughs> Landell lived. Well, Landell lived. So yeah, yeah. and if you Turned read the Vader again. book, you piss off those guys. They actually dragged Vader into the back of um, a uh, like a pub, and they took a box cutter and cut the hell out of his legs, and he had to go to the hospital, and he couldn't. He had, he was actually kicked out of Japanese wrestling. Um, because of the altercation he had with them for some time, they said, okay, we'll, uh, we'll bandage you up. Everything's fine, but you pissed off this guy. You need to leave now. So there's a story like that in the book that uh, those were not the guys to tell jokes with. Well, Buddy Landell had no issues. I I don't know. Got lucky. Yeah. That sounds very much (laughs) like him. Yeah. Uh, um, Which of the guys do you think actually read the books after you were done? I don't know if any of them know how to read, so I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Tito, for sure. Okay. Um, we had someone from PWI help edit his books. They missed a couple of uh, a couple of edits in there. And he said, I don't understand. He said, Did you read it? And I'm like, mm-hmm. yeah, I read it. And he's like, well, uh, the editor didn't read it because there's a couple of misspelled words here and there you know he's a teacher like i am too so he was pissed off that they missed a couple of things so for sure he read it um uh book to book cover to cover probably a few of them (laughs) (laughs) i don't know this is an incriminating question so i'm not going to go any further (laughs) that's fair that's fair leave it leave it there (laughs) after you said none of them can read now it's going to be incriminating (laughs) that is just a joke (laughs) okay (laughs) <laughs> I think Sabu will be the first one to tell you though that they they tell him that all the time on uh, Twitter. So he makes jokes about not being able to read. And that's where that comes from. <laughs> but he can actually read, <laughs> mostly soup cans. <laughs> <laughs> now, have any subjects in the book come back and bitched at you for what you wrote? Uh, it's not even the wrestlers. Like even anyone else in the book. There's too. a little, a couple of, couple of, couple of. Uh, references to ring rats that tito didn't appreciate he's been a um, uh, married man for a long time didn't out him on anything just he didn't like one or two sentences didn't think i got his voice correct with the way he told something so but he says he likes the other 98 percent of the book so no problem i haven't had a uh actually I did have one other case uh sabu uh we had a funny idea for the end of the book where he went um, out and did a series of fu tweets so he just went through and dissed like five or ten guys and would tell why he didn't like mm-hmm. them this is a goofy ending jim Cornette kind of like made fun of it recently on his podcast and that mm-hmm. fire went a little viral that review um but he he slammed jim ross in there and when he when he did it i said is this cool and he's like yeah yeah and i'm like all right so we put it in but now he had a regret after he printed it that it was in there so much so that he wants to rip the page out when he mails it i'm like i don't think he can do that we just won't print it in the second printing. but um he did make me call up jim ross and tell him listen that was kind of a rib and uh you know uh he apologized he pretty much said that jim was jim ross was cheap and didn't pay the original chic uh, the full amount of money that he owed him for a particular show uh, out in uh, Detroit somewhere. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's, but that's all a hearsay according to the Sheik, according to his uncle. Like, right, I don't know right. that, you know, I mean, so you get yeah, that. But I mean, the way that it was worded in the book was, uh, and a big F you tweet goes out to Jim Ross for owing uh, my uncle a hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is for uh, merchandise and ticket sales for this one that you're a cheap bastard f you you know what i mean <laughs> like, so it was like it was and pretty you, it was stiff <laughs> and you had to call you had to call and say that was a rib yeah well well i had to tell him that i embellished a little bit to make it seem more like sabu's uh at the time his his twitter personality which was really brutal like he was really super heel on on twitter but he's lightened up now he's he finally stopped being like totally heel on on twitter he was really bad for a while yeah that's got to be hard for guys to like under i mean people get twitter now but in the beginning like people social media you know you thought okay so i have to continue my character now on this yeah and but a lot of the things you say they don't come off right on twitter and people don't understand that you're in character or you know they'll dig stuff up from like 10 years ago i.e uh what's that guy's name uh kevin hart Yes. Yeah. Guy like that. Yeah. I mean, he yeah. got kicked out of the Oscars for that or whatever it was. Right. Which is crazy. Cause he's a comedian. Right. 
And like some of his jokes aren't going to land and they're really not going to land in written form because you're reading them. And I mean, the same as a wrestler, like if you're saying that's why, you know, people joked about. So when Hogan, when um, there was a documentary about the whole Hogan Gawker thing. Right. And one of the things that he said, one of the big um, things during his testimony was there's Hulk Hogan and there's Terry Bollea. Right. Like what you saw was Hulk Hogan. And then they actually got into the part where they're like, was that Hulk Hogan's penis or was that Terry Bollea's penis? Like they started <laughs> saying things like that. But like there are, you know, they're playing characters. Right. You know, it's 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 one of the only thing. It's one of the only professions where, you know, when Tom Cruise is done with a movie, he's not, you know, Jack Reacher in the right, grocery right. store. He's Tom Cruise. <laughs> yeah. But when Hulk Hogan goes to the grocery store, brother, he's got to be Hulk Hogan. Right. You know, when and somebody it's just comes this, up to him and wants that autograph. You know, I, I, I get it. Yeah. yeah, it's this weird thing. So you kind of got to say, well, you have the you can use a scapegoat like that's really not me on Twitter. That's me being whoever yeah. on Twitter. So you can kind of get away with it. So Sabu could say he was just healing. Yeah, the book. I and, think some of it was he was healing, too. Like, like he was yeah. playing. He was definitely playing the character. And then sometimes he does kind of go into uh, uh, back in the 80s day and act in a certain way. So, <laughs> but, but whatever, you know. Right. I'll kind of do it. <laughs> so what projects are you working on now? So again, ODB, mm-hmm. uh, we got that. Um, we're doing uh, The Good Brothers. I'm finishing Just Incredibles book. It's pretty much done. Um, uh, I might be doing something with the guy that used to drive Superfly Snooker around a lot. His name was the Metal Maniac. He's more, mostly like kind of like a, a Northeast indie legend. I might do mm-hmm. something with him soon. Uh I've got a Ken Patera book in the works with a buddy of mine um, mm-hmm. named Simon Gregory. He's he's writing the book. I'm helping him uh, publish it. Same thing for Chavo Guerrera, uh, senior Chavo classic. Um, mm-hmm. His book was just about done before he passed. So we're going to put that book out. Uh, and there's also a Curtis Hughes book in the works with another guy like this. So I've got three guys I'm kind of publishing. I'm, I'm helping them get it out there. I'm trying to pay it forward kind of like and trying to help these guys like if they don't know how to get a book out there to show them my formula and make it work for themselves. So Awesome. And uh, tell people where they can find you online, website, everything like that. Cool. Yeah. Uh, pu- publishing website is wohw.com. My publishing company is called Walking on Hot Waffles. Uh, so you can check out all the books. All right, there. explain that. Please explain that. <laughs> <laughs> we can't just leave it like that. Yeah, you can't just you can't drop that name in there and then let's not talk about it. All right. So I'll give you the behind the scenes on that quick. The Cliff Notes version is that I also promoted a little bit. There is a Northeast indie called uh World of Hurt Wrestling. And I owned the uh domain and um I reassigned the letters when it kind of uh went away for a short time. Now a new guy took it over but I own W O H W and I'm like a four letter domain is awesome. I want to, oh, yeah. I'm going to name my publishing company something, but I'm not going to call it world of hurt. I thought about calling it world of hurt, like something or, you know, publishing world of hurt writing. Yeah. Yeah. Actually that's probably what it was. Cause it was W O H W and I'm like, that's kind of cheesy. I'm going to make it walking on hot waffles. Kind of like walking <laughs> on hot coals, you know? Yeah. I like how you went from that's cheesy. To- <laughs> yeah. That's cheesy. We got to add waffles. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Right. Uh, let me, let me ask this. What, what, what made the cutting room floor? What names didn't make it? Uh, like I said before, Sid. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, what, which names for the websites? Like oh. which W H W O H W did you yeah, think yeah, of that yeah. didn't work? Um, I don't know that I had something ever. It was, I was thinking about just Kenny Casanova productions, Kenny Casanova Uh LLC. I don't like book titles, um, that are like, uh, wrestling with my past or wrestling with the future or Mm. wrestling in my head. So I didn't Mm. want anything like that. Uh (laughs) It was like, that's lame. There's too many of those, uh, um, Conrad and Bruce Pritchard, uh, something to wrestle with. You see what I'm saying? Or that work the wrestle on the title. Um, yeah. Stuff like that. Um, not a big fan of that. Uh, by the way, Bruce Pritchard's book, I will write this. Uh, mm-hmm. We've already done half of it. Oh, nice. He did 250 pages. And then he got called back to WWE. And, and now he can't. So we're waiting for him to get fired. When he gets fired, we'll put the book out. <laughs> so. I, you know what? I listen to that podcast re- religiously. I mean, when it's on now, because he's so busy. Yeah. But I don't, I, and I don't think he wants to get fired, but he's so busy. Like, I feel like it would, Probably would might, like it, right? might be a relief. <laughs> <laughs> Might be like, okay, because he didn't want to do any of this. And now he's like, once yeah. again, it's his right hand man I and he's never around anymore. Yeah. And like, I mean, the, a lot of those shows, like I talk to Steph about this all the time. Like, I love all the shows. The the one Conrad does with Tony Shivani, like I literally like cry laughing. 
yeah. and some of the stuff. Nice. And like, yeah. And, and Pritchard, I actually interviewed Bruce. I was one of the first people I did an article about him and Conrad for Rolling Stone oh, website, wow. like right. 2015, maybe okay. like when the podcast first launched. Sure. And, and like, he was a great guy to talk to. Like we talked on the phone for about like an hour That's and great. he's a super nice guy, but I love all those podcasts. The Bruce Pritchard one, I'd be totally interested because that guy's had a crazy yeah. res- wrestling career. Yeah. I listen to that too a lot, but I'm very selective. Like I won't uh, just listen to anyone. Like I'll pick out, I'll say, Oh, I got to hear Paul bear special, mm-hmm. you know, and I, and I'll right. really get into that. And then sometimes I'll get a little something there and that'll end up in my book. I'm like, I'll get a little piece or something. And I'm like, Oh geez, I didn't, I didn't know that, you know? Yeah. Um, they're super well researched. He's great at that. You know, another yeah. podcast I recommend is um, for entertainment is uh, keeping it 100 with Conan is my favorite. So mm-hmm. that one, I get a big kick out of that show. <laughs> that That's one of the ones I have to listen to, but like when you listen to other ones and do your, like, there's only so many hours in the day to get in right. wrestling <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> like yeah. after a while, maybe I'll get that to Steph to listen to. <laughs> I'm just consumed to talk and shop and that hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the funny thing. Too, if I get, and I mentioned that um, if I were to use that as a source for my book, I, I would never have any. Don't book. no, no. <laughs> never. The it's worst. entertaining, but I can't really find the history there. It's too hard. Yeah. No, if you go on YouTube though and, and listen to some of the very original ones that are real hot mess when they're recording from hotel rooms in Japan, <laughs> those are ridiculous. I'm sure you'll get, if you haven't already, you'll get a ton of fantastic Japan stories. I'm sure. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, by the way, that's how we're doing it. Uh, the first book is all pre WWE. So it's, it's everything up to, you know, leaving Japan headed to WWE, they're standing at their doorstep and then it ends. And then the new book, a second book will probably spawn off to that, That's which awesome. will be WWE and Impact and uh, um, AEW. So, nice. Okay. We're looking forward to that. Well, cool. Kenny, thanks for coming on, and we'd love thanks to have you on me. again. When Appreciate the other it. books come out, we'll talk to you again. Sounds good. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir.